If I tell you pyramids or Nile River, you're probably thinking Egypt, which is not wrong. But this country has more ground covered by the Nile and three times more pyramid. Welcome to Sudan. So today I'm going a few hundreds of kilometers north of Khartoum, Sudan to see the pyramids that nobody is talking about. And trust me guys, this was not an easy trip to plan because most of the tourism agencies and tour agent here in the country, Sudan, they operate from October to April because after that, it is way too hot and we're going in the middle of the desert. Right now, it is the end of May. Everyone warned me, but I'll, I don't know if I'll ever be back in Sudan. So there's no way I'm missing out on those pyramids. I need to see them. I need to show them to you. My driver just called, he's here, let's go. One backpack, this tiny camera. I never traveled this light, kind of feels good. I'm sleeping in the desert, did I tell you that? In the desert. I got a truck and a full team with me. Just me, I'm special. So we just stopped here at the market on the side of the road for a quick falafel. That's a great way to start the day. Very good. So it was about a million degrees in that, that bakery, uh, but I was asking them like, how many pieces of bread, those flatbread are you making in a day? And they're saying up to 15,000 every single day. This is really impressive. In Sudan, a lot of the cabs are actually Toyota Corollas from late 60s, beginning of the 70s, and they're still running. So this trip should take about four to five hours, depending on traffic, road condition, and things like that, I guess. And apparently we're going through many checkpoints. Something here in Sudan, if you're a foreigner, you need a permit to actually leave Khartoum. So the agency that I dealt with did the permit for me, uh, but I can't wait to see how those checkpoints are gonna go. I love how these guys travel, they take a lot of breaks. Stretch your legs. All these piles of rocks here in the middle of the desert is actually granite and it's actually a natural formation and it's just the basement of Africa. You might be wondering why we have so much equipment. There's some at the top but inside is also filled with things because basically like I said earlier in this video, Everything is closed at this time of the year, so we have to be self-sufficient. So we brought our own tent and everything, so it's gonna be quite interesting. So we just arrived at the uh, archeological site of Naga. This is our first stop, and this guy is gonna teach us everything about it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, one of the important things here the god Amun here have uh, two different forms. Amun of Nabata is totally human. Uh, yeah, it is a human being, okay. a body of human being, and a head of ram. And uh, the god Amun of Na of of Sebes is totally. Uh, a human being. So this here is the temple of Amun. First of all, it is mind-blowing that I'm completely alone here. There's just a bunch of goats and donkeys because we're in the middle of the desert and this is the only place that actually offers some sort of shade. So it's a little bit cooler for them. So this place has three rooms that were divided back in the days depending on your status. So the normal people would come here in the first room, then going into the second section of it, this was for the VIPs. And then finally, in the back, right here, this is where the priest and only the king could come. And this is where they would have the uh, Amun statue, which is the body of a man and the head of a goat. And they were worshiping that statue uh, twice a year during two festival. That's what I learned from my God, I, I think. Um, so yeah, it's very impressive. This entire um, temple basically was built um, at 1200 BC. This is crazy. This is over like three, 4,000 years old. No, three, three, I'm just not good at math. 
Oh, and one more thing, this altar here is actually a replica. You can see that it, it looks much more recent than everything else around because this, the original one is actually in a museum where it belongs because to be honest, there is not a lot of security um, around this place. The only people living here um, are actually nomads that are moving around the desert depending on the season. But uh, yeah, if you can't protect them, at least put them in a museum. So from generation from now, people can still enjoy those, those treasures. So about a hundred meters from the first place we stopped, there's another beautiful temple there. The amount of details and history that are on each and every wall is just unbelievable. And I'm not even going to try to explain everything that my guy just said, because I'm not, I'm not going to have it right. This is called the kiosk and it's one of the most beautiful and impressive building that they have here. It's a, it's a Nubian one. And basically like if you look around, there's different types of architecture. Um, this in the middle, you can recognize some Egyptian influence. And, but if you look at those columns there, this is definitely Roman influence. So it's very interesting. There's just so much history. This is very impressive and that's just the first stop. So back in the car and we'll see where we go next. So we just arrived at the second site and once again, you know, a little fence all around, but really there's nobody checking anything, no cans of security or anything. We just opened the fence ourselves and we're in. So most of the damage is actually caused by the sand, the wind, the erosion and just time. But see, within the past few years, they've started to build these retainer walls, which is are there to basically like maintain the structure for as long as possible. So that's actually very good. So these sites that we're visiting are all still active with the archaeologists coming here about two to three months a year. Uh, not right now because the weather is just too harsh right now. It's about like 46 degrees. I'm sweating a lot, but you know, I don't know if I'll ever be back in Sudan. So there's no way I'm missing out on all these cool places. So archaeologists cannot agree right now on the main purpose of this site from back in the days. There's two main hypotheses. The first one was a seasonal palace you know like in the summer you go to your chalet or something like that so that's option number one and then option number two was actually an elephant training center for war and because some of the places the ramp to come into this place are actually very narrow they're thinking that it wasn't for african elephants it was actually for indian elephants so you know pretty interesting while i'm here talking to myself under this very harsh sun the team is prepping lunch there's actually a nice little shaded area i'm gonna go see what they're cooking so when i try to book this trip all the agency like do not prepare anything for me special like i'm gonna eat with the boys sleep with the boys like i'm, I'm totally fine i'm not looking for luxury but they didn't listen so now i have this beautiful lunch all for myself i'll share i'll share of course but yeah looks delicious for a meal in the middle of the desert doesn't get much better than that i don't want to offend nobody but like i think that like falafels are really good with ketchup <laughs> i know that's probably wrong but don't hate if you didn't try it Okay. okay so you can tell that the temple behind me was actually rebuilt and the story is they found that temple completely destroyed and covered in meters of sand and they digged it out and rebuilt it to what it is today it's phenomenal
So we're gonna do a quick a coffee stop on the side of the road. There's those tea ladies that they call them that are they're pretty much everywhere. It's just part of the culture. You guys know how much I hate coffee, but you also know that if it's part of the culture, I'll try it. It won't be rude. I'll probably say I like it, but just remind yourself that I hate it. Well, I didn't like it, but I'm glad I tried the coffee because I'm all about the culture. And my guy was actually, well, not actually trying. He did explain to me on the ground with some chuck or something, the entire history of the Nile. It was really, really interesting. Really, really cool. <laughs> They're scared. So we're gonna set up camp for the night right here in the middle of the desert very excited about that and uh, we're quite popular like people came with their camels from all around just to see what we're doing Let me give you a, an accommodation tour. So this is where I'm sleeping tonight. Beautiful tent, little mattress. This is glamping if I've ever seen it. So I think it's gonna be cozy as long as the weather, not the weather, but the temperature goes down. I think it's gonna be just fine. Then my bathroom right here. That's my sink. That's it, that's all I need. These pyramids right there are actually a replica so people can see what they actually looked like before you know the top was actually damaged so that's what it looked like so why all those pyramids have their top chopped off the reality is is that in 1834 an Italian explorer came here looking for gold and he used dynamite to blow up basically the top of all those pyramids and in this one behind me he actually found eight kilos of gold in the top part of the pyramid so that's what happened this is one of those moments that i realized how special this is because i have this entire site to myself there's nobody around except for the pyramid keeper um, so it's it's beautiful it's so peaceful it's so much history and you know like go back two weeks i didn't even know that sudan had pyramids and when you think about it it blows my mind because when you tell people nile and pyramids they're like egypt but the nile covers more ground in sudan and sudan also has about three times more pyramids than egypt so definitely a hidden gem Yeah, the quantity of sand in my shoes right now is something else. I'm gonna bring a little bit of the sand back home, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Just look around, guys. Middle of the desert. This is where we're spending the night. This is my tent. This is the truck with like the kitchen and everything. I'm really wondering where they're gonna sleep because that's the only tent. It's a mystery. We'll, we'll see. Maybe we all share that tent. It's not a big tent for four big boys, but yeah. We're gonna, the chef is tr actually preparing supper. Not sure what it's gonna be, but I don't even care because I'm just so happy to be here. It is a stunning, such a great experience. That felt amazing. Try some hibiscus juice, so it's flower juice. Apparently when you have one, you'll want another one. That is so good. Yeah.
So it is 7 p.m. and the temperature finally dropped under 40. It's now 39 degrees. It's not like nice, but it's much better than what it was in the middle of the afternoon. And overnight, it's supposed to go as low as 32 uh, at 1 a.m. before slowly creeping back up to mid 40s and tomorrow again. Also, I never want to drink anything else in my life but hibiscus juice. Mm. Now I'm gonna try the peanut soup. Mm. It does taste like peanut butter though. A little bit different. Yeah, yeah because it is, uh, yeah. So even though it's 8.49, I'm gonna call it a night because I really wanna plan on waking up really early tomorrow morning to go back to the pyramids for sunrise, which I think is gonna be outstanding. Like they told me it's gonna be outstanding, so I trust them. Otherwise, like the team is really good, like really experienced driver, really, really good chef. I mean, like he just made a really like a feast in the middle of the desert, so like big shout out. And then the guide is a 10 out of 10, like so much knowledge. So yeah, and just wait tomorrow, the way we're gonna come back to Khartoum, quite something. Good morning from the desert. Um, I wish I could tell you that I slept well and I'm well rested, but it was really hot all through the night like i doubt that it dropped under like 35 plus like within the tent limited in wind i'm also covered in sand but you know if you ask me i loved every second of it and i'm just so happy to be able to have the privilege to just wake up here in the middle of the desert just about 200 meters from those pyramids so right now i'm walking alone towards the pyramids and i hope to catch a good sunrise this place is truly in the middle of nowhere, but there's uh, two actual buildings that are built not too far from it. Behind that mountain there, there's the uh, the camp where the archaeologists are living while on site. And then behind me here, it's actually a museum that they're building. So I'm not sure when it's going to be open, but there's going to be, I guess, exhibitions about, guess what? The pyramids. morning again completely alone how great is that also like even the keeper is not here so every site that we've been to there's actually kind of a designated keeper one of the nomad just goes there every time there's visitors like they just show up make sure that everything is fine even yesterday one of the sign uh, when the site they made me sign in a book saying that I've been here on this date um, but yeah otherwise Nobody. So you can like enter some parts of like the pyramids. You can't go far, like there's a wall right there. So like it's about like you know, probably like 15 feet long, but like the details on the wall everywhere is just unbelievable. And once again, like, I'm alone here. Like, it's crazy. Even though these Nubian pyramids are a little bit younger compared to the famous Egyptian pyramids, they built over four hundreds of them all around Sudan in different sites and today there are still over 220 of them that are still standing. Well, I don't think we're gonna get a sunrise. It's too late now because like if you look there, like the sun is kind of up, but back there, I think it was just too hazy. So we didn't see it. But you know what? Doesn't matter because this lake is still great. The archaeologists are actually doing a great work of conservation. 
There's another site behind me there uh, with another group of pyramid and those were actually completely destroyed but in the 1900 the uh, German ar archaeologists came and rebuilt the pyramid as much as they could with whatever they found um, covered in sand so they digged it out rebuilt it up so it's very impressive because it looks original okay so now i just have to find my gopro which i left on one of those pyramids for a time lapse but it was useless because we didn't get any sunrise and then after that i think we're just gonna do a quick stop at the other pyramid site because i didn't go there yet and after that we're gonna see what the boys are cooking for breakfast So breakfast should be in about 30 minutes. Camp is on the other side of this little mountain here. It's not really a mountain, but when everything is flat around, it does look like a mountain. So let's walk back. By the way, I didn't film my, my crew sleeping because that's creepy, but they just put three mattresses outside in the sand and they're like, this is where they sleep. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. Like, I don't want a tent. Like, I want to do that too. They were like, no, no, you don't do that. You sleep in a tent. The desert is dangerous. There's ants that are coming to bite you and there's scorpions everywhere. And I was like, oh. So anyway, I didn't do that, but those guys are legends. I don't know how they found me in the middle of nowhere. But the mobile market is here. And an old Sudanese coin with a camel on it. Uh, I paid 500 for that. I got a nice little bracelet for Tracy. I paid 1000 for that. And then I got a really cool old Sudanese knife. Um, they wanted 20000 for it and they negotiated down for 8000 So, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm quite a negotiator. There's just a party here this morning. Uh, all the nomads around came to say hi. They wanted to sell something, but you know what? It's important to support locals. So now, back on the road, guys. So we just arrived by the Nile and we are gonna start making our way back, a portion of it at least, on the Nile on a river cruise, I guess. So that's pretty cool. Um, now, the property where we're launching from, they have like a bunch of like animals. Apparently like the guy who owns the place wants to like make like a little park out of it. But you know, it's a lot of animals in cages, which is... To be honest, I'm not sure where I am, but don't come here for the animals. Like he has in like one cage, like a Janet cat, a tortoise, a massive lizard, and uh, a tree irox in, in the same cage. Weird. So which Nile is that? This is the Nile. This is just the Nile. Okay, no blue, no white, just the Nile. The Nile River is actually the longest river in the entire world and it is the only river in Africa that runs from south to north. It is separated with what they call cataracts. Uh, it's basically just rapids and it makes it very uh, tricky to cross certain parts, which we are arriving at one of those rapids right now. But apparently there's nothing you can do with an experienced driver. Back in the days, these rapids were actually preventing Egyptians to come into this part um, of Sudan. And I can definitely not see why, because the engine is a full throttle and it's still struggling to go through that part. This place is so nice and peaceful. And apparently the, pla the specific place where we're at right now goes down 50 meters down, which is very impressive, but otherwise 
all the greeneries around, very nice. And those rock features are beautiful too. My bad, I thought that the truck would pick us up back somewhere else, but we're, we just came back where we started. Which is totally fine, that cruise was really, really nice. This is definitely something I just crossed off my bucket list, but it's also something I didn't even know that was on my bucket list, so yeah. <laughs> this dog does not want to be friend. I tried everything. <laughs> So one last meal with these guys. The food has been like amazing. Just they're feeding me way, way too much. But I think I figured it out. I think the minimum quantity that they're preparing is probably like for a couple, but I'm alone. So I end up eating way too much. But wow, it was delicious like every single meal. Well, that was another great lunch and another great day. I'm gonna see you guys back at the hotel. What a trip this was. First of all, a few points. So a big, big thanks to ITC Sudan for making this trip happen. It was very last minute, but very well planned after all. And talking about planning, because this is Sudan and because foreigners need permits to leave Khartoum, then I highly suggest that you deal with a company like ITC Sudan because they made the process like seamless. It took 72 hours to have this uh, famous permit and the staff that I was with the crew they seemed to like know their way around and we, even though we went through six different checkpoints which I didn't film because it's a checkpoint you're not really supposed to um, it, it was it was seamless so no issues there they made it really really easy talking about my team they were amazing Amir the driver very experienced very skilled driver saved the entire time loved it Bagar the food was so good. He made miracles literally in the middle of the desert. And Khalid, of course, amazing guy, over 11 years of experience as a guide. I truly, truly learned a lot. So that was such a good trip. Two weeks ago, I didn't know nothing about Sudan. And here I am right now in Sudan wanting to come back. So yeah, that I hope you guys enjoyed this mini series about Sudan as much as I enjoyed making it. I'm gonna link the other videos that we that I we Trace is not here that I made down below if you want to check the two other videos out. And otherwise, we'll see you back in Kenya.